I have observed that those who have accomplished the greatest results are those who keep under the body, are those who never grow excited or lose self-control, but are always calm, self-possessed, patient, and polite. Booker T. Washington People who knew Jackie Robinson as a young man probably wouldn't have predicted that they'd one day see him become the first black player in Major League Baseball. Not that he wasn't talented, or that the idea of eventually integrating white baseball was inconceivable. It's that he wasn't exactly known for his restraint and poise. As a teenager, Robinson ran with a small gang of friends who regularly found themselves in trouble with local police. He challenged a fellow student to a fight at a junior college picnic for using a slur. In a basketball game, he surreptitiously struck a hard fouling white opponent with the ball so forcefully that the kid bled everywhere. He was arrested more than once for arguing with and challenging police who he felt had treated him unfairly. Before he started at UCLA, he spent the night in jail and had a gun drawn on him by an officer for nearly fighting a white man who'd insulted his friends. And in addition to rumors of inciting protests against racism, Jackie Robinson effectively ended his career as a military officer at Camp Hood in 1944 when a bus driver attempted to force him to sit in the back in spite of laws that forbade segregation on base buses. By arguing and cursing at the driver, and then directly challenging his commanding officer after the fracas, Jackie set in motion a series of events that eventually led to his court-martial. Despite being acquitted, he was discharged shortly afterward. It's not just understandable and human that he did this, it was probably the right thing to do. Why should he let anyone else treat him that way? No one should have to stand for that. Except sometimes they do. Are there not goals so important that we'd put up with anything to achieve them? When Branch Rickey, the manager and owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers, scouted Jackie to potentially become the first black player in baseball, he had one question. Do you have the guts? I'm looking, Rickey told him, for a ball player with the guts not to fight back. In fact, in their famous meeting, Ricky play-acted the abuse Robinson was likely to experience if he accepted Ricky's challenge. A hotel clerk refusing him a room, a rude waiter in a restaurant, an opponent shouting slurs. This, Robinson assured him, he was ready to handle. There were plenty of players Ricky could have gone with. He needed one who wouldn't let his ego block him from seeing the bigger picture. As he started in baseball's farm system, then in the pros, Robinson faced more than just slights from service staff or reticent players. There was an aggressive, coordinated campaign to libel, boo, provoke, freeze out, attack, maim, or even kill. In his career, he was hit by more than 72 pitches, nearly had his Achilles tendon taken out by players who aimed their spikes at him, and that says nothing of the calls he was cheated out of and the breaks of the game that didn't go his way. Yet Jackie Robinson held to this unwritten pact with Ricky, never giving in to explosive anger, however deserved. In fact, in nine years in the league, he never hit another player with his fist. Athletes seem spoiled and hot-headed to us today, but we have no concept of what the leagues were like then. In 1956, Ted Williams, one of the most revered and respected players in the history of the game, was once caught spitting at his fans. As a white player, he could not only get away with this, he later told reporters, I'm not a bit sorry for what I did. I was right, and I'd spit again at the same people who booed me today. Nobody's going to stop me from spitting. For a black player, this behavior would have been not only unthinkable, but short-sighted beyond comprehension. Robinson had no such freedom. It would have ended not only his career, but set back his grand experiment for a generation. Jackie's path called for him to put aside his ego and in some respects his basic sense of fairness and rights as a human being. Early in his career, the manager of the Philadelphia Phillies, Ben Chapman, was particularly brutal in his taunting during a game. They're waiting for you in the jungles, black boy, he yelled over and over. We don't want you here, nigger, he said. Not only did Jackie not respond, despite, as he later wrote, wanting to grab one of those white sons of bitches and smash his teeth in with my despised black fist. A month later, he agreed to take a friendly photo with Chapman to help save the man's job. The thought of touching, posing with such an asshole, even 60 years removed, almost turns the stomach. 
Robinson called it one of the most difficult things he ever did, but he was willing to because it was part of a larger plan. He understood that certain forces were trying to bait him, to ruin him. Knowing what he wanted and needed to do in baseball, it was clear what he would have to tolerate in order to do it. He shouldn't have had to, but he did. Our own path, whatever we aspire to, will in some ways be defined by the amount of nonsense we're willing to deal with. Our humiliations will pale in comparison to Robinson's, but it will still be hard. It will still be tough to keep our self-control. The fighter Boss Rutten sometimes writes the letter R on both his hands before fights, for the word rusta, which means relax in Dutch. Getting angry, getting emotional, losing restraint is a recipe for failure in the ring. You cannot, as John Steinbeck once wrote to his editor, lose temper as a refuge from despair. Your egos will do you no favors here, whether you're struggling with a publisher, with critics, with enemies, or a capricious boss. It doesn't matter that they don't understand, or that you know better. It's too early for that. It's too soon. Oh, you went to college? That doesn't mean the world is yours by right. But it was the Ivy League? Well, people are still going to treat you poorly, and they'll still yell at you. You have a million dollars or a wall full of awards? That doesn't mean anything in the new field you're trying to tackle. It doesn't matter how talented you are, how great your connections are, or how much money you have. When you want to do something, something big and important and meaningful, you will be subjected to treatment ranging from indifference to outright sabotage. Count on it. In this scenario, ego is the exact opposite of what is needed. Who can afford to be jerked around by impulses or believe that you're God's gift to humanity or too important to put up with anything you don't like? Those who have subdued their ego understand that it doesn't degrade you when others treat you poorly. It degrades them. Dogs, God bless them, are passionate. As numerous squirrels, birds, boxes, blankets, and toys can tell you, they do not accomplish most of what they set out to do. A dog has an advantage in all this, a graciously short-term memory that keeps at bay the creeping sense of futility and impotence. Reality for us humans, on the other hand, has no reason to be sensitive to the illusions we operate under. Eventually, it will intrude. What humans require in our ascent is purpose and realism. Purpose, you could say, is like passion with boundaries. Realism is detachment and perspective. When we are young or when our cause is young, we feel so intensely. Passion, like our hormones, runs strongest in youth, that it seems wrong to take it slow. This is just our impatience. This is our inability to see that burning ourselves out or blowing ourselves up isn't going to hurry the journey along. Passion is about. I'm so passionate about blank. Purpose is two and four. I must do blank. I was put here to accomplish blank. I'm willing to endure blank for the sake of this. Actually, purpose de-emphasizes the I. Purpose is about pursuing something outside yourself as opposed to pleasuring yourself. More than purpose, we also need realism. Where do we start? Where do we go first? What do we do right now? How are we sure that what we are doing is moving us forward? What are we benchmarking ourselves against? Great passions are maladies without hope, as Goethe once said, which is why a deliberate, purposeful person operates on a different level, beyond the sway or the sickness. They hire professionals and use them. They ask questions. They ask what could go wrong. They ask for examples. They plan for contingencies. Then they are off to the races. Usually they get started with small steps, complete them, and look for feedback on how the next set can be better. They lock in gains, and then they get better as they go, often leveraging those gains to grow exponentially rather than arithmetically. Is an iterative approach less exciting than manifestos, epiphanies, flying across the country to surprise someone, or sending 4,000 word stream of consciousness emails in the middle of the night? Of course. Is it less glamorous and bold than going all in and maxing out your credit cards because you believe in yourself? Absolutely. 
Same goes for the spreadsheets, the meetings, the trips, the phone calls, software tools, and internal systems, and every how-to article ever written about them and the routines of famous people. Passion is form over function. Purpose is function, function, function. The critical work that you want to do will require your deliberation and consideration, not passion, not naivete. It would be far better if you were intimidated by what lies ahead, humbled by its magnitude, and determined to see it through regardless. Leave passion for the amateurs. Make it about what you feel you must do and say, not what you care about and wish to be. Remember Talleyrand's epigram for diplomats, surtout pas trop de zèle, above all, not too much zeal. Then you will do great things. Then you will stop being your old, good-intentioned, but ineffective self. Follow the canvas strategy. Great men have almost always shown themselves as ready to obey as they afterwards proved able to command. Lord Mayon. In the Roman system of art and science, there existed a concept for which we have only a partial analog. Successful businessmen, politicians, or rich playboys would subsidize a number of writers, thinkers, artists, and performers. More than just being paid to produce works of art, these artists performed a number of tasks in exchange for protection, food, and gifts. One of the roles was that of an anthembulo, literally meaning one who clears the path. An anthembulo proceeded in front of his patron anywhere they traveled in Rome, making way, communicating messages, and generally making the patron's life easier. The famous epigrammist Marshall fulfilled this role for many years, serving for a time under the patron Mela, a wealthy businessman and brother of the Stoic philosopher and political advisor Seneca. Born without a rich family, Marshall also served under another businessman named Petulius. As a young writer, he spent most of his day traveling from the home of one rich patron to another, providing services, paying his respects, and receiving small token payments and favors in return. Here's the problem. Like most of us with our internships and entry-level positions, or later on, publishers or bosses or clients, Marshall absolutely hated every minute of it. He seemed to believe that this system somehow made him a slave. Aspiring to live like some country squire, like the patrons he serviced, Marshall wanted money and an estate that was all his own. There, he dreamed, he could finally produce his works in peace and independence. As a result, his writing often drags with a hatred and bitterness about Rome's upper crust, from which he believed he was cruelly shunted aside. For all his impotent rage, what Marshall couldn't see was that it was his unique position as an outsider to society that gave him such a fascinating insight into Roman culture that it survives to this day. Instead of being pained by such a system, what if he'd been able to come to terms with it? What if, gasp, he could have appreciated the opportunities it offered? Nope, it seemed to eat him up inside instead. It's a common attitude that transcends generations and societies. The angry, underappreciated genius is forced to do stuff she doesn't like for people she doesn't respect as she makes her way in the world. How dare they force me to grovel like this? The injustice, the waste. We see it in recent lawsuits in which interns sue their employers for pay. We see it in kids more willing to live at home with their parents than submit to something they're overqualified for. We see it in an inability to meet anyone else on their terms, an unwillingness to take a step back in order to potentially take several steps forward. I will not let them get one over on me. I'd rather we both have nothing instead. It's worth taking a look at the supposed indignities of serving someone else, because in reality not only is the apprentice model responsible for some of the greatest art in the history of the world, everyone from Michelangelo to Leonardo da Vinci to Benjamin Franklin has been forced to navigate such a system. But if you're going to be the big deal you think you're going to be, isn't this a rather trivial imposition? When someone first gets a job or joins a new organization, he's often given this advice. Make other people look good and you will do well. Keep your head down, they say, and serve your boss. Naturally, this is not what the kid who is chosen over all the other kids for the position wants to hear. 
It's not what a Harvard grad expects. After all, they got that degree precisely to avoid this supposed indignity. Let's flip it around so it doesn't seem so demeaning. It's not about kissing ass. It's not about making someone look good. It's about providing the support so that others can be good. The better wording for this advice is then, find canvases for other people to paint on. Be an anthem bulo. Clear the path for people above you, and you will eventually create a path for yourself. Does this help me do what I have set out to do? Does this allow me to do what I need to do? Am I being selfish or selfless? In this course, it is not who do I want to be in life, but what is it that I want to accomplish in life? Setting aside selfish interest, it asks, what calling does it serve? What principles govern my choices? Do I want to be like everyone else, or do I want to do something different? In other words, it's harder because everything can seem like a compromise. Although it's never too late, the earlier you ask yourself these questions, the better. Boyd undeniably changed and improved his field in a way that almost no other theorists in Sun Tzu or von Clausewitz. He was known as Genghis John for the way he never let obstacles or opponents stop him from what he needed to do. His choices were not without their costs. He was also known as the Ghetto Colonel because of his frugal lifestyle. He died with a drawer full of thousands of dollars in uncashed expense checks from private contractors, which he equated with bribes. That he never advanced above Colonel was not his doing. He was repeatedly held back for promotions. He was forgotten by history as a punishment for the work he did. Think about this the next time you start to feel entitled, the next time you conflate fame and the American dream. Think about how you might measure up to a great man like that. Think about this the next time you face that choice. Do I need this? Or is it really about ego? Are you ready to make the right decision, or do the prizes still glitter off in the distance? To be or to do, life is a constant roll call. Become a student. Let no man's ghost come back to say my training let me down. Sign in the New York Fire Department Training Academy. In April in the early 1980s, a single day became one guitarist nightmare and became another's dream and dream job. Without notice, members of the underground metal band Metallica assembled before a planned recording session in a decrepit warehouse in New York and informed their guitarist Dave Mustaine he was being thrown out of the group. With few words, they handed him a bus ticket back to San Francisco. That same day, a decent young guitarist, Kirk Hammett, barely in his 20s and a member of a band called Exodus, was given the job. Thrown right into a new life, he performed his first show with the band a few days later. One would assume that this was the moment Hammett had been waiting for his whole life. Indeed, it was. Though only known in small circles at the time, Metallica was a band that seemed destined to go places. Their music had already begun to push the boundaries of the genre of thrash metal, and cult stardom had already begun. Within a few short years, it would be one of the biggest bands in the world, eventually selling more than 100 million albums. It was around this time that Kurt came to what must have been a humbling realization, that despite his years of playing and being invited to join Metallica, he wasn't as good as he'd like to be. At his home in San Francisco, he looked for a guitar teacher. In other words, despite joining his dream group and quite literally turning professional, Kirk insisted that he needed more instruction, that he was still a student. The teacher he sought had a reputation for being a teacher's teacher and for working with musical prodigies like Steve Vai. Joe Satriani, the man Hammett chose as his instructor, would himself go on to be known as one of the best guitar players of all time and sell more than 10 million records of his unique, virtuosic music. Teaching outside of a small music shop in Berkeley, Satriani's playing style made him an unusual choice for Hammett, but that was the point. Kirk wanted to learn what he didn't know, to firm up his understanding of the fundamentals so that he might continue exploring this new genre of music that he now had a chance to pursue. 
Satriani makes it clear where Hammett was lacking. It wasn't talent, certainly. He said, the main thing with Kirk was he was a really good guitar player when he walked in the door. He was already playing lead guitar. He was already shredding. He had a great right hand. He knew most of his chords. He just didn't learn how to play in an environment where he learned all the names and how to connect everything together. That didn't mean that their sessions were some sort of fun study group. In fact, Satriani explained that what separated Hammett from the others was his willingness to endure the type of instructions that they wouldn't. He said he was a good student. Many of his friends and contemporaries would storm out complaining, thinking I was too harsh of a teacher. Satriani's system was clear, that there would be weekly lessons, that these lessons must be learned, and if they weren't, that Hammett was wasting everyone's time and needn't bother to come back. So for the next two years, Kirk did as Satriani required, returning every week for objective feedback, judgment, and drilling in technique and musical theory for the instrument he would soon be playing in front of thousands, then tens of thousands, then literally hundreds of thousands of people. Even after that two-year study period, he would bring to Satriani licks and riffs he'd been working on with the band and learn to pare down this instinct for more and hone his ability to do more with fewer notes and to focus on feeling those notes and expressing them accordingly. Each time he improved as a player and as an artist. The power of being a student is not just that it is an extended period of instruction. It also places the ego and ambition in someone else's hands. There's a sort of ego ceiling imposed. One knows that he is not better than the master he apprentices under not even close. You defer to them. You subsume yourself. You cannot fake or bullshit them. And education can't be hacked. There are no shortcuts besides hacking it every single day. If you don't, they drop you. We don't like thinking that someone is better than us or that we have a lot left to learn. We want to be done. We want to be ready. We are busy and overburdened. For this reason, updating your appraisal of your talents in a downward direction is one of the most difficult things to do in life, but it is almost always a component of mastery. Lord Chesterfield Passion. It's all about passion. Find your passion, live passionately, inspire the world with your passion. People go to Burning Man to find passion, to be around passion, to rekindle their passion. Same goes for Ted and the now enormous South by Southwest and a thousand other events, retreats, and summits, all fueled by what they claim to be life's most important force. Here's what those same people haven't told you. Your passion may be the very thing holding you back from power or influence or accomplishments, because just as often we fail with, no because of, passion. Early on in her ascendant political career, a visitor once spoke of Eleanor Roosevelt's passionate interest in a piece of social legislation. The person had meant it as a compliment, but Eleanor's response is illustrative. Yes, she did support the cause, she said, but I hardly think the word passionate applies to me. As a genteel, accomplished, patient woman, born while the embers of the quiet Victorian virtues were still warm, Roosevelt was above passion. She had purpose. She had direction. She wasn't driven by passion, but by reason. George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, and Donald Rumsfeld, on the other hand, were passionate about Iraq. Christopher McCandless was bursting with passion as he headed into the wild. So was Robert Falcon Scott as he set out to explore the Arctic, bitten as he was with the pole mania as were many climbers of the tragic 1996 Everest climb, momentarily struck with what psychologists now call goal idiocy. The inventor and the investors of the Segway believed that they had a world-changing innovation on their hands and put everything into evangelizing it. That all these talented, smart individuals were fervent believers in what they sought to do was without dispute. It's also clear that they were also unprepared and incapable of grasping the objections and real concerns of everyone else around them. The same is true for countless entrepreneurs, authors, chefs, business owners, politicians, and designers that you've never heard of and never will hear of because they sunk their own ships before they'd hardly left the harbor.
Like every other dilettante, they had passion and lacked something else. To be clear, I'm not talking about caring. I'm talking about passion of a different sort, unbridled enthusiasm, our willingness to pounce on what's in front of us with the full measure of our zeal, the bundle of energy that our teachers and gurus have assured us is our most important asset. It is that burning, unquenchable desire to start or to achieve some vague, ambitious, and distant goal. This seemingly innocuous motivation is so far from the right track it hurts. Remember, zealot is just a nice way to say crazy person. A young basketball player named Louis Alcindor Jr., who won three national championships with John Wooden at UCLA, used one word to describe the style of his famous coach, dispassionate as in not passionate. Wooden wasn't about rah-rah speeches or inspiration. He saw those extra emotions as a burden. Instead, his philosophy was about being in control and doing your job and never being, quote, passion slave. The player who learned that lesson from Wooden would later change his name to one you remember, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. No one would describe Eleanor Roosevelt or John Wooden or his notoriously quiet player Kareem as apathetic. They wouldn't have said that they were frenetic or zealous either. Roosevelt, one of the most powerful and influential female activists in history, and certainly America's most important first lady, was known primarily for her grace, her poise, and her sense of direction. Wooden won 10 titles in 12 years, including seven in a row, because he developed a system for winning and worked with his players to follow it. Neither of them were driven by excitement, nor were they bodies in constant motion. Instead, it took them years to become the person they became known as. It was a process of accumulation. In our endeavors, we will face complex problems, often in situations we've never faced before. Opportunities are not usually deep virgin pools that require courage and boldness to dive into but instead are obscured and dusted over, blocked by various forms of resistance. What is really called for in these circumstances is clarity, deliberateness, and methodological determination. But too often we proceed like this. A flash of inspiration. I want to do the best and biggest blank ever. Be the youngest blank. The only one to ever blank. The firstest with the mostest. The advice? Okay, well here's what you need to do step by step to accomplish it. The reality? We hear what we want to hear. We do what we feel like doing. And despite being incredibly busy and working very hard, we accomplish very little. Or worse, find ourselves in a mess we never anticipated. Because we only seem to hear about the passion of successful people, we forget that failures shared the same trait. We don't conceive of the consequences until we look at their trajectory. With the segue, the inventor and investors wrongly assumed a demand much greater than ever existed. With the run-up to the war in Iraq, its proponents ignored objections and negative feedback because they conflicted with what they so deeply needed to believe. The tragic end to the Into the Wild story is the result of youthful naivete and a lack of preparation. With Robert Falcon Scott, it was overconfidence and zeal without consideration of the possible dangers. We imagine Napoleon was brimming with passion as he contemplated the invasion of Russia, and only finally became free of it as he limped home with a fraction of the men he'd so confidently left with. In many more examples we see the same mistakes, over-investing, under-investing, acting before someone is really ready, breaking things that require delicacy, not so much malice as the drunkenness of passion. Passion typically masks a weakness. Its breathlessness and impetuousness and franticness are poor substitutes for discipline, for mastery, for strength, and purpose and perseverance. You need to be able to spot this in others and in yourself, because while the origins of passion may be earnest and good, its effects are comical and then monstrous. Passion is seen in those who can tell you in great detail who they intend to become and what their success will be like. They might even be able to tell you specifically when they intend to achieve it and describe to you legitimate and sincere worries they have about the burdens of such accomplishments. They can tell you all the things they are going to do or have even begun, but they cannot show you their progress 
because there rarely is any. How can someone be busy and not accomplish something? Well, that's the passion paradox. If the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over and expecting different results, then passion is a form of mental retardation, deliberately blunting our most critical cognitive functions. The waste is often appalling in retrospect. The best years of our life burned out like a pair of spinning tires against the asphalt. Up ahead there will be slights, dismissals, little fuck yous, one-sided compromises, you'll get yelled at. You have to work beyond the scenes to salvage what should have been easy. All of this will make you angry. This will make you want to fight back. This will make you want to say, I am better than this. I deserve more. Of course, you'll want to throw it in other people's faces. Worse, you'll want to get in other people's faces. People who don't deserve the respect, recognition, or rewards they are getting. In fact, these people will often get perks instead of you. When someone doesn't reckon you with the seriousness that you'd like, the impulse is to correct them. As we all wish to say, do you know who I am? You'll want to remind them of what they've forgotten. Your ego screams for you to indulge it. Instead, you must do nothing. Take it. Eat it until you're sick. Endure it. Quietly brush it off and work harder. Play the game. Ignore the noise. For the love of God, do not let it distract you. Restraint is a difficult skill, but a critical one. You will often be tempted. You will probably even be overcome. No one is perfect with it, but try we must. It is a timeless fact of life that the up and coming must endure the abuses of the entrenched. Robinson was 28 when he started playing with the Dodgers, and he'd already paid plenty of dues in life as both a black man and a soldier. Still, he was forced to do it again. It's a sad fact of life that new talents are regularly missed, and even when recognized, often unappreciated. The reasons always vary, but it's part of the journey. But you're not able to change the system until after you've made it. In the meantime, you have to find some way to make it suit your purposes, even if those purposes are just extra time to develop properly, to learn from others on their dime, to build your base and establish yourself. As Robinson succeeded, after he proved himself as the Rookie of the Year and as an MVP, and as his spot on the Dodgers was certain, he began to more clearly assert himself and his boundaries as a player and as a man. Having carved out his space, he felt that he could argue with umpires. He could throw a shoulder if he needed to make a player back off or to send a message. No matter how confident or famous Robinson became, he never spit on fans. He never did anything that undermined his legacy. A class act from opening day until the end, Jackie Robinson was not without passion. He had a temper and frustrations like all of us do. But he learned early that the tightrope he walked would tolerate only restraint and had no forgiveness for ego. Honestly, not many paths do. Get out of your own head. A person who thinks all the time has nothing to think about except thoughts, so he loses touch with reality and lives in a world of illusions. Alan Watts It is Holden Caulfield, the self-absorbed boy walking the streets of Manhattan, struggling to adjust to the world. It is a young Arturo Bandini in Los Angeles, alienating every person he meets as he tries to become a famous writer. It is the Blue Blood Binks Bowling in 1950s Uptown New Orleans, trying to escape the everydayness of life. These fictional characters all had something in common. They couldn't get out of their own heads. In J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye, Holden can't stay in school, is petrified of growing up, and wants desperately to get away from it all. In John Fonte's Ask the Dust, part of a series known as the Bandini Quartet, this young writer doesn't experience the life he is living. He sees it all across a page in a typewriter, wondering if nearly every second of his life is a poem, a play, a story, a news article with him as its main character. In Walker Percy's The Movie Goer, his protagonist, Binks, is addicted to watching movies, preferring an idealized version of life on the screen to his own uncomfortable ennui. 
It's always dangerous to psychoanalyze a writer based on his work, but these are famously autobiographical novels. When we look at the writer's lives, the facts are clear. J.D. Salinger really did suffer from a sort of self-obsession and immaturity that made the world too much for him to bear, driving him from human contact and paralyzing his genius. John Fonte struggled to reconcile his enormous ego and insecurity with relative obscurity for most of his career, eventually abandoning his novels for the golf course and Hollywood bars. Only near death, blind with diabetes, was he finally able to get serious again. The Moviegoer, Walker Percy's first book, came only after he'd conquered his almost teenage indolence and existential crisis, which lasted alarmingly into his 40s. How much better could these writers have been had they managed to get through these troubles earlier? How much easier would their lives have been? It's an urgent question they pushed onto their readers with their cautionary characters. Because sadly this trait, the inability to get out of one's head, is not restricted to fiction. 2400 years ago, Plato spoke of the type of people who are guilty of feasting on their own thoughts. It was apparently common enough even then to find people who, instead of finding out how something they desire might actually come about, they pass that over so as to avoid tiring deliberations about what's possible. They assume that what they desire is available and proceed to arrange the rest. Taking pleasure in thinking through everything they'll do when they have what they want, thereby making their lazy souls even lazier. Feel people preferring to live in passionate fiction than in actual reality. The Civil War General George McClellan is the perfect example of this archetype. He was chosen to command the Union forces because he checked all of the boxes of what a great general should be. West Point grad, proven in battle, a student of history, of regal bearing, loved by his men. The pretense of knowledge is our most dangerous vice because it prevents us from getting any better. Studious self-assessment is the antidote. The result, no matter what your musical taste happened to be, was that Hammett would become one of the great metal guitarists in the world, taking thrash metal from an underground movement into a thriving global musical genre. Not only that, but from those lessons, Satriani honed his own technique and became much better himself. Both the student and the teacher would go on to fill stadiums and remake the musical landscape. The mixed martial arts pioneer and multi-title champion Frank Shamrock has a system he trains fighters in that he calls plus, minus, and equal. Each fighter to become great, he said, needs to have someone better that they can learn from, someone lesser who they can teach, and someone equal that they can challenge themselves against. The purpose of Shamrock's formula is simple, to get real and continuous feedback about what they know and what they don't know from every angle. It purges out the ego that puffs us up, the fear that makes us doubt ourselves, and any laziness that might make us want to coast. As Shamrock observed, false ideas about yourself destroy you. For me, I always stay a student. That's what martial arts are about, and you have to use that humility as a tool. You put yourself beneath someone you trust. This begins by accepting that others know more than you and that you can benefit from their knowledge and then seeking them out and knocking down the illusions you have about yourself. The need for a student mindset doesn't stop with fighting or music. A scientist must know the core principles of science and the discoveries occurring on the cutting edge. A philosopher must know deeply and also know how little they know, as Socrates did. A writer must be versed in the canon and read and be challenged by her contemporaries too. A historian must know ancient and modern history as well as their specialty. Professional athletes have teams of coaches and even powerful politicians have advisors and mentors. Why? To become great and to stay great, they must all know what came before them, what is going on now and what comes next. They must internalize the fundamentals of their domain and what surrounds them, without ossifying or becoming stuck in time. They must always be learning. We must all become our own teachers, tutors, and critics. Think about what Hammett could have done, and what we might have done in his position were we to suddenly find ourselves a rock star, 
or a soon-to-be rock star in our chosen field. The temptation is to think, I've made it, I've arrived. They've tossed the other guy because he's not as good as I am. They chose me because I have what it takes. Had he done that, we'd probably never have heard of him or the band. There are, after all, plenty of forgotten metal groups from the 1980s. A true student is like a sponge, absorbing what goes on around him, filtering it, latching on to what he can hold. A student is self-critical and self-motivated, always trying to improve his understanding so he can move on to the next topic or the next challenge. A real student is also his own teacher and his own critic. There is no room for ego there. Take fighting as an example again, where self-awareness is particularly crucial because opponents are constantly looking to match strength against weakness. If a fighter is not capable of learning and practicing every day, if he is not relentlessly looking for areas of improvement, examining his own shortcomings, and finding new techniques to borrow from peers and opponents, he will be broken down and destroyed. It is not all that different for the rest of us. Are we not fighting for or against something? Do you think that you are the only one who hopes to achieve your goal? You can't possibly believe you're the only one reaching for that brass ring. It tends to surprise people how humble aspiring greats seem to have been. What do you mean they weren't aggressive, entitled, aware of their own greatness or their destiny? The reality is that, though they were confident, the act of being an eternal student kept these men and women humble. It is impossible to learn that which one thinks one already knows, Epictetus says. You can't learn if you think you already know. You will not find the answers if you are too conceited and self-assured to ask the questions. You cannot get better if you are convinced you are the best. The art of taking feedback is such a crucial skill in life particularly harsh and critical feedback. We not only need to take this harsh feedback, but actively solicit it, labor to seek out the negative precisely when our friends and family and brain are telling us we're doing great. The ego avoids such feedback at all costs, however. Who wants to remand themselves to remedial training? It thinks it already knows how and who we are. That is, it thinks we are spectacular, perfect, genius, truly innovative. It dislikes reality and prefers its own assessment. Ego doesn't allow for proper incubation either. To become what we ultimately hope to become often takes long periods of obscurity, of sitting and wrestling with some topic or paradox. Humility is what keeps us there, concerned that we don't know enough, that we must continue to study. Ego rushes to the end, rationalizes that patience is for losers, wrongly seeing it as a weakness, and assumes that we're good enough to give our talents a go in the world. As we sit down to proof our work, as we make our first elevator pitch, prepare to open our first shop, as we stare out into the dress rehearsal audience, ego is the enemy, giving us wicked feedback, disconnected from reality. It's defensive precisely when we cannot afford to be defensive. It blocks us from improving by telling us that we don't need to improve. Then we wonder why we don't get the results we want, why others are better, and why their success is more lasting. Today, books are cheaper than ever. Courses are free. Access to teachers is no longer a barrier. Technology has done away with that. There is no excuse for not getting your education. And because the information we have before us is so vast, there is no excuse for ever ending that process either. Our teachers in life are not only those that we pay, as Hammett paid Satriani, nor are they necessarily part of some training dojo like it is for Shamrock. Many of the best teachers are free. They volunteer because like you, they were once young and had the same goals as you. Many don't even know that they are teaching. They are simply exemplars or even historical figures whose lessons survive in books and essays. But ego makes us so hard-headed and hostile to feedback that it drives them away or puts them beyond our reach. It's why the old proverb says, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Don't be passionate. You seem to want that vivida vis animae, 
which spurs and excites most young men to please, to shine, to excel. Without that desire and the pains necessary to be considerable, depend upon it, you never can be so. When you're just starting out, we can be sure of a few fundamental realities. One, you're not nearly as good or as important as you think you are. Two, you have an attitude that needs to be readjusted. Three, most of what you think you know or most of what you learn in books or in school is out of date or wrong. There's one fabulous way to work all of that out of your system. Attach yourself to people and organizations who are already successful and subsume your identity into theirs and move both forward simultaneously. It's certainly more glamorous to pursue your own glory, though hardly as effective. Obeisance is the way forward. That's the other side of this attitude. It reduces your ego at a critical time in your career, letting you absorb everything you can without the obstructions that block others' vision and progress. No one is endorsing sycophancy. Instead, it's about seeing what goes on from the inside and looking for opportunities for someone other than yourself. Remember that Anthem Bulo means clearing the path, finding the direction someone already intended to head and helping them pack, freeing them up to focus on their strengths. In fact, making things better rather than simply looking as if you are. Many people know of Benjamin Franklin's famous letters written under names like Silence Dogwood. What a clever young prodigy they think and miss the most impressive part entirely. Franklin wrote those letters, submitted them by sliding them under the print shop door, and received absolutely no credit for them till much later in his life. In fact, it was his brother, the owner, who profited from their immense popularity, regularly running them on the front page of his newspaper. Franklin was playing the long game, though, learning how public opinion worked, generating awareness of what he believed in, crafting his style and tone and wit. It's a strategy he used time and again over in his career once even publishing in his competitor's paper in order to undermine a third competitor. For Franklin saw the constant benefit in making other people look good and letting them take credit for your ideas. Bill Belichick, the four-time Super Bowl winning head coach of the New England Patriots, made his way up the ranks of the NFL by loving and mastering the one part of the job that coaches disliked at the time, analyzing film. His first job in professional football for the Baltimore Colts was one he volunteered to take without pay, and his insights, which provided ammunition and critical strategies for the game, were attributed exclusively to the more senior coaches. He thrived on what was considered grunt work, asked for it, and strove to become the best at precisely what others thought they were too good for. He was like a sponge, taking it all in, listening to everything, one coach said. You gave him an assignment and he disappeared into a room and you didn't see him again until it was done. And then he wanted to do more, said another. As you can guess, Belichick started getting paid very soon. Before that, as a young high school player, he was so knowledgeable at the game that he functioned as sort of an assistant coach even while playing the game. Belichick's father, himself an assistant football coach for Navy, taught him a critical lesson in football politics that if he wanted to give his coach feedback or question a decision, he needed to do it in private and self-effacingly so as not to offend his superior. He learned how to be a rising star without threatening or alienating anyone. In other words, he'd mastered the canvas strategy. You can see how easily entitlement and a sense of superiority, the trappings of ego, would have made the accomplishments of either of these men impossible. Franklin never would have been published if he'd prioritized credit over creative expression. Indeed, when his brother found out, he literally beat him out of jealousy and anger. Belichick would have pissed off his coach and then probably been benched if he'd one-upped him in public. He certainly wouldn't have taken his first job for free, and he wouldn't have sat through thousands of hours of film if he cared about status. Greatness comes from humble beginnings. It comes from grunt work. It means that you're the least important person in the room, and to change that with results. There is an old saying, say little, do much. What we really ought to do is update and apply a version of that to our early approach. Be lesser, do more. Imagine if for every person you met, you thought of some way to help them, something you could do for them, and you looked at it in a way that entirely benefited them and not you. The cumulative effect this would have over time would be profound. You would learn a great deal by solving diverse problems. 
you develop a reputation for being indispensable, you'd have countless new relationships. You'd have an enormous bank of favors to call upon down the road. That's what the Canvas strategy is about, helping yourself by helping others, making a concerted effort to trade your short-term gratification for a longer-term payoff. Whereas everyone else wants to get credit and be respected, you could forget credit. You can forget it so hard that you're glad when others get it instead of you. That was your aim after all. Let others take their credit on credit while you defer and earn interest on the principal. The strategy part of it is the hardest. It's easy to be bitter, like Marshall, to hate even the thought of subservience. To despise those who have more means, more experience, more status than you. To tell yourself that every second not spent doing your work or working on yourself is a waste of your gift. To insist, I will not be demeaned like this. Once we fight this emotional and egotistical impulse, the canvas strategy is easy. The iterations are endless. Maybe it's coming up with ideas to hand over to your boss. Find people, thinkers, up-and-comers to introduce them to each other. Cross wires to create new sparks. Find what nobody else wants to do and do it. Find inefficiency and waste and redundancies. Identify leaks and patches to free up resources for new areas. Produce more than everyone else and give your ideas away. In other words, discover opportunities to promote their creativity, find outlets and people for collaboration, and eliminate distractions that hinder their progress and focus. It's a rewarding and infinitely scalable power strategy. Consider each one an investment in relationships and in your own development. The Canvas strategy is there for you at any time. There is no expiration date on it either. It's one of the few that age does not limit. On either side, young or old, you can start at any time, before you have a job, before you're hired, and while you're doing something else, or if you're starting something new or find yourself inside an organization without strong allies or support. You may even find that there's no reason to ever stop doing it, even once you've graduated to heading your own projects. Let it become natural and permanent. Let others apply it to you while you're too busy applying it to those above you. Because if you pick up this mantle once, you'll see what most people's egos prevent them from appreciating. The person who clears the path ultimately controls its direction, just as the canvas shapes the painting. Why did he turn out to be quite possibly the worst Union general, even in a crowded field of incompetent and self-absorbed leaders? Because he could never get out of his own head. He was in love with his vision of himself as the head of a grand army. He could prepare an army for battle like a professional. But when it came to lead one into battle, when rubber needed to meet the road, troubles arose. He became laughably convinced that the enemy was growing larger and larger. It wasn't. At one point he actually had a three times advantage. But he was convinced of constant threats and intrigues from his political allies. There weren't any. He was convinced that the only way to win the war was with the perfect plan and a single decisive campaign. He was wrong. He was so convinced of all of it that he froze and basically did nothing for months at a time. McClellan was constantly thinking about himself and how wonderful he was doing, congratulating himself for victories not yet won, and more often for horrible defeats he had saved the cause from. When anyone including his superiors, questioned this comforting fiction, he reacted like a petulant, delusional, vainglorious, and selfish ass. By itself, that's insufferable, but it meant another thing. His personality made it almost impossible to do what he needed to do most, win battles. A historian who fought under McClellan at Antietam later summed it up. His egotism is simply colossal. There is no other word for it. We tend to think that ego equals confidence, which is what we need to be in charge. In fact, it can have the opposite effect. In McClellan's case, it deprived him of the ability to lead. It robbed him of the ability to think that he even needed to act. And repeated opportunities he missed would have been laughable were it not for the thousands and thousands of lives they cost. The situation was made worse by the fact that two pious, quiet Southerners, Lee and Stonewall Jackson, with a penchant for taking the initiative, were able to embarrass him with inferior numbers and inferior resources.
which is what happens when leaders get stuck in their own head, can happen to us too. The novelist Anne Lamott describes that ego story well. If you're not careful, she warns young writers, station KFKD, KFOCT, will play in your head 24 hours a day, non-stop, in stereo. As she put it, out of the right speaker in your inner ear will come an endless stream of self-aggrandizement, the recitation of one's specialness, of how much more open and gifted and brilliant and knowing and misunderstood and humble one is. Out of the left speaker will be the rap songs of self-loathing, the lists of all the things one doesn't do well, of all the mistakes one has made today and over an entire lifetime, the doubt, the assertion that everything one touches turns to shit, that one doesn't do relationships well, that one is in every way a fraud, incapable of selfless love, that one had no talent or insight, and on and on and on. Anyone, particularly the ambitious, can fall prey to this narration, good and bad. It is natural for any young, ambitious person, or simply someone whose ambition is young, to get excited and swept up by their thoughts and feelings, especially in a world that tells us to keep and promote a personal brand. We're required to tell stories in order to sell our work and our talents, and after enough time, we forget where the line is that separates our fictions from reality. Ultimately, this disability will paralyze us or it will become a wall between us and the information we need to do our jobs, which is largely why McClellan continually fell for flawed intelligence reports he ought to have known were wrong. The idea that his task was relatively straightforward, that he just needed to get started, was almost too easy and too obvious to someone who had thought so much about it all. He's not that different from the rest of us. We are all full of anxieties, doubts, impotence, pain, and sometimes a little tinge of crazy. We're like teenagers in this regard. As the psychologist David Elkind has famously researched, adolescence is marked by a phenomenon known as the imaginary audience. Consider a 13-year-old so embarrassed that he misses a week of class, positive that the entire school is thinking and murmuring about some tiny incident that in truth hardly anyone noticed or a teenage girl who spends three hours in front of the mirror each morning, as if she's about to go on stage. They do this because they are convinced that their every move is being watched with rapt attention by the rest of the world. Even as adults, we're susceptible to this fantasy during a harmless walk down the street. We plug in some headphones and all of a sudden there's a soundtrack. We flip up our jacket collar and consider briefly how cool we must look. We replay that successful meeting that we're heading toward in our head. The crowds part as we pass. We're fearless warriors on our way to the top. It's the opening credits montage. It's a scene in a novel. It feels good. So much better than those feelings of doubt and fear and normalness. And so we stay stuck inside our own heads instead of participating in the world around us. That's ego, baby. What successful people do is curb such flights of fancy. They ignore the temptations that might make them feel important or skew their perspective. General George C. Marshall, essentially the opposite of McClellan, even though they briefly held the same position a few generations apart, refused to keep a diary during World War II, despite the requests of historians and friends. He worried that it would turn his quiet, reflective time into a sort of performance and self-deception that he might second-guess difficult decisions out of concern for his reputation and future readers, and warp his thinking based on how they would look. All of us are susceptible to these obsessions of the mind, whether we run a technology startup or we are working our way up the ranks of the corporate hierarchy or have fallen madly in love. The more creative we are, the easier it is to lose the thread that guides us. Our imagination in many senses an asset, is dangerous when it runs wild. We have to rein our perceptions in. Otherwise, lost in the excitement, how can we accurately predict the future or interpret events? How can we stay hungry and aware? How can we appreciate the present moment? How can we be creative within the realm of practicality? Living clearly and presently takes courage. Don't live in the haze of the abstract. Live with the tangible and real. Even if, especially if, 
it's uncomfortable. Be part of what's going on around you. Feast on it. Adjust for it. There's no one to perform for. There's just work to be done and lessons to be learned in all that is around us. The Danger of Early Pride A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. C.S. Lewis <laughs>